and welcome to the online forest summit called BC Forest, the People's Convergence. I'm Jennifer Houghton and I'm one of the co-organizers of this summit and I'm honored to be here tonight with Kateri Koster. Welcome Kateri. And Mike Anderson. Welcome Mike. Thank you. So the topic that uh, Kateri and Mike are going to cover tonight are is uh, managing forestry from the land as opposed to from an office and uh, the potential for First Nations partnership and uh, this is a fabulous topic. I'm so glad that we're covering this. So I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit about Kateri and Mike and then uh, we'll let um, these guys launch into their uh, information for tonight. So Mike Anderson is a settler who grew up in the ranching country in the interior of BC and he's been living on the same rural acreage for the past 70 plus years and working in forest management for over 50 years. He's been managing his own woodlot license for 30 years and he's worked with, okay, you guys are gonna have to help me out, Skeetchiston? Skeetchiston Indian Band. Thank you. Skeetchiston. Skeetchiston Indian Band for over 20 years as the CEO of Skeetchiston Natural Resources, LLP. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Agriculture from the University of British Columbia in 1970 and is a registered professional forester and an RP bio. So what does the RP stand for, Mike? A registered professional biologist. Great, thank you. And working in, oh gosh, um, you guys are going to have to help me with this, Sequempakulu? Sequempakulu? Sequempakulu. Sequempakulu. Yeah, working in Sequempakulu and or is it on behalf and, Ulu? and uh, on behalf of First Nations has provided him a holistic and altogether different perspective than most non First Nations. His background and education allow him to walk on two legs, incorporating and working with both the Western and Indigenous ways of knowing and doing. He has a vested interest in value added and viewing the forest for more than just fiber. He's been making value-added forest products since he was 12 years old and has been designing and constructing uh, buildings all his life, incorporating this into his forest management. Mike actively practices alternative harvesting and taking the limited available volume and making the most out of it for jobs and opportunities. He understands the importance and potential of First Nations partnerships and putting volume, management, and capacity back into the hands of First Nations. Mike says he's grateful to provide his perspective on community value out of uh, the forests from his over 60 years experience and his relationship with First Nations. Over the course of his life and career, he has seen the land around him evolve from virgin forests to what it is now. He currently homesteads and resides in Tunkwa Creek, BC. Welcome, Mike. Um, so before uh, I go on to Kateri's bio, what does that mean to walk on two legs? What does that expression mean? That means uh, that means to uh, to uh, respect the indigenous perspective on forestry and forest management and uh, uh, the relationship we have with all animals, all beings on the forest, and also respect uh, Western science. Uh, we, that's uh, kind of the motto of uh, what we do within uh, our Kelmenti to Sequepmuk relationship, uh, which is a government government relationship between the Sequepmuk people and the government of BC. And uh, uh, speaking of First Nations, I want to acknowledge that um, what we call Grand Forks, which is where I live now, I, a, is the traditional territory of the Selic, the Sinaiks, and the Tinaha peoples. So over to Kateri and so I'd like, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm living and working uh, within the traditional territory of the Sequatmic people within Skeetis and Ulu. Thank you, Mike. So, uh, Kateri, you guys might have to help me with the pronunciation here. I apologize in advance if I don't get it right. So, <laughs> Kateri is with the Sequatmic and the uh, Stewikum Hialum. Is that close? So welcome Highland First Nation. So welcome Highland First Nation. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> Located in the interior of BC in the communities of Canoe Creek and Dog Creek, BC. 
She attended Thompson Rivers University in Crown Loops, BC, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts degree in 2013 and a Juris Doctor degree from the Faculty of Law in 2019. She's interested in access to justice, advocacy, human rights, and Indigenous law. She started her journey with the Kuominti Sequipmik as an intern in the summer of 2019 and is grateful to work for the QS in her current role as strategic coordinator for forestry. In doing so, she has the opportunity to undertake cutting edge work to help the Sequipmik law in uh, stewardship for the protection of land and resources. She takes pride in being a member of the team Skupakin and working on behalf of the Sequipmik signatories for the betterment of Sequipmik Sequipmik Ulu. <laughs> All right, um, very impressive bios here. And uh, again, just such an honor to have both of you guys here joining us in the online summit. Okay, we're gonna go over to you, Mike. Um, tell us about um, how, where you are, you're managing the forest for more than just fiber and you're respecting all values. Okay, so I guess uh, in my forest management, I've been doing it for quite some time now. I've been managing 320 acres of uh, uh, private property and about another 1,500 acres of uh, woodlot. Uh, the only clear cutting I've ever done is to, uh, to clear, cut, clear land for hay fields. Other than that, I've always used selection logging. Uh, I've used uh, light equipment, I've used tractors, I've used horse logging, a variety of different methods, uh, but never, never clear cutting, always selection. So that because you, you leave a forest there that is still provides habitat values for the animals, provides protective cover for the animals, it, uh, it is uh, still hydrologically functioning, it is still protecting all the understory species. Uh, the Skeetjeson band has over 160 understory species that have a variety of uses, whether it be for medicine or for food value or for technological purposes. And uh, this kind of forestry protects most of those species. And you still, and you still get your fiber out of there. Uh, you leave the, the younger trees behind so they produce uh, better fiber in the future and you leave the very old mother trees behind so that they can nurture the younger trees. So in the kind of forestry that you're practicing, are you doing any, are you planting any seedlings? Are you doing any plantations? I, uh, I've just started, I'm going to plant next spring. It's the first time I've planted anything. Like I like to say, I've never had to plant a tree in my life uh, because I've always left a fully, a fully stocked stand. And, but next year I did, I did have a logger in here with conventional equipment that kind of got carried away and made some very big landings that have not regenerated. And I'm going to put some seedlings in the ground next spring. So Mike, can, is there any way you can lower the screen a little bit so that we can see your mouth and your chin? There we go. Like that? Yeah, that's perfect. It's easier for people to, when you can kind of read people's lips at the same time as you're listening. Nice, thanks. Okay. okay, well, so what I keep hearing about the way that they're doing industrial forestry in most of the province is that um, with the clear cutting and the plantations that they're doing, they're starting to have to think about planting different species because of climate change. So with the kind of forestry you're practicing, does climate change come into, how does climate change factor into your practices? Well, I guess climate change is going to factor into my practices a certain amount at this point in time. I'm working in a Douglas fir uh, ecosystem. Uh, I expect with climate change that uh, your ecozones will move up the mountain and uh, your ecozones will move north. So, you know, I might want to start planting some ponderosa pine at some point in time here. In the meantime, my, my fir forest is doing perfectly all right. Uh, the only thing is, when, with the logging of it, I could thin it out. If I thin it out, it becomes more like a lower elevation fir forest. Uh, and with plantation forestry, it's not just, it's not just climate change. They have to do some species selection on. They've, 
they've basically taken diverse forests and they turn them into monocultures. And it's very, very dangerous to have a monoculture. You have a monoculture that's one species and all single age. So that anything that affects that species at, at any stage, growth stage in its life can wipe out the whole forest. And this is kind of what has happened with the mountain pine beetle. It's kind of what has happened in a lot of plantations with uh, uh, pine blister rust, uh, things like that. You know, it's, it's a very dangerous thing to take a, a biodiverse forest and turn it into a monoculture. Uh, and this is where First Nations uh, perspective comes in, is First Nations respect all, all the biodiversity on the land base. And biodiversity, in my mind, is one of the biggest advantages BC has over the rest of the world. We have an extremely biodiverse province. We have extremely biodiverse ecosystems. And yet we're trying to alter them and, and turn them into something that's an awful lot less. Yeah, and so you just described um, some of the reasons why we can't continue to log and harvest the way that we have in BC. What are some of the other reasons that come to mind why we can't continue to clear cut and do industrial forestry the way we have been for so long? Because we've run out of timber and we've run out of jobs. And we're also definitely <laughs> affecting biodiversity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, yeah. Affecting, we're affecting hydrological regimes. You know, we've got a situation on the Elfin Hill Fire where it burnt about the plantations and whatnot and a lot of industrial, uh, industrialized area where the land is no longer stable. We have mudslides. We've had 20, 20 mudslides between Savannah and, and uh, Clinton within the last two or three years because it's a combination of the amount of roads that have been built up there the amount of timber that's been harvested and then a fire just kind of, you know, it was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. So we not only have issues with water regimes uh, where, you know, the band I worked for uh, in, 19, in 2017, before the fire, we spent all spring rebuilding five road crossings from flooding coming off of that area. Uh, we were not, not even finished rebuilding the road crossings before the fire hit. And then again, this year, we're still build, rebuilding those same road crossings uh, because there's too much water coming down now because it all comes in one big, one big rush. And then later on in the season and uh, in the winter time, there's, there's nothing coming. And this also has detrimental effects on the salmon populations. It's uh, directly affecting both steelhead and coho salmon, which are both uh, endangered species within the Thompson watershed. Some of the things we've been talking about with other people in the summit is um, we had a conversation about uh, workers versus environmentalists and how we've got to sort of get rid of that image because it's not just people who dub themselves as environmentalists, like people who live in cities or people who are maybe kind of hippie-ish who are thinking, oh, we have to save the land and save the forest and it's some sort of dreamy thing. There's a lot of practical reasons, real life reasons why we need to save the forest and it's not just about you know, bears and mushrooms, it's, it's for our own good. And uh, you've seen that firsthand on, on the ground as well as I have, Mike. And um, so can you sort of, um, just so that I get a visualization and, and everybody gets visualization, where, how much land are, what's the size of the land base that you're logging on? And is it public land or private land or how does that factor in? On behalf of myself, I've logged on uh, 300, 360 acres of private land and 1,500 acres of public land, which is my woodlot license. On behalf of the Skeet, just in a, we, we log within their uh, traditional territory, which is, gosh, I'm not sure what it is, probably 200,000 hectares. Uh, and we do, and what we're doing now is we have one license where we've been purposely uh, going out of our way to find Douglas fir stands and do selection logging on them. What I like to call light impact selection logging, which is uh, we try to do as gentle a job as possible. We try to keep the roads as small as possible, utilize all the pre-existing roads rather than build new roads, utilize all the pre-existing landing areas rather than use, uh, you know, build new landings and also keep those landing areas as small as possible. Uh, we try to take out uh, uh, probably the, what one would term the peeler component because we try to leave all trees under 10 inches 
or I guess that's what, 25 centimeters. Uh, and we try to leave all those big mother trees behind and concentrate on taking the, the mature, uh, larger trees out, not taking all of them, but taking a good component of them, leaving the younger, smaller ones behind in the hopes that, uh, you know, give it 30 years, they're gonna be, they're gonna be bigger ones. I wanted to ask about, uh, so once you guys cut down the log, once you cut down the trees, uh, what happens to them? Where do they go? Well, most, most of our trees at Skeetchison at this point in time go to a mill. They go to the highest bidder. Uh, you know, we maybe sell peelers in one direction, sell saw log in another direction, pulpwood in another direction. But at the same time as we're doing this, we have what we call a value added program. We've got a, a 12,000 square foot shop where we've uh, fully uh, uh, put most of the uh, woodworking equipment that we could find in there. We've uh, designed and, and built a number of uh, post and beam round buildings. And we're trying to concentrate on selling, you know, uh, manufacturing our logs into, into those kinds of things rather than just dimensional lumber. We do at the same time cut a lot of dimensional lumber on a two-man mill, but, uh, and you know, we're not very efficient. Like, we're not like the big guys. We can't produce 200,000 board feet of shift or 500,000 board feet of shift with 15 guys. We produce 600 board feet of shift with two guys, but that's two jobs. You know, those guys that produce 200,000 board feet of shift with 15 guys, we could make 100 jobs out of that. And this is one of the biggest issues in forestry today. It's not the environmentalists and it's not the, you know, those kinds of things that are the biggest threat against sustainable forestry in BC. It's the fact that we're running out of timber because we've mechanized to the point where there's no jobs left, you know, and, and the mills sit there and talk about, gosh, uh, you know, we're running out of timber. Well, no wonder they're running out of timber. What they've done is they've put all their investments into mechanization. They've invested heavily in mechanization for the last 30, 40 years. The other thing they've invested in is the, is the southeastern United States because they know darn well they're going to run out of timber here, run out of viable timber within the next 10 years, and they want somewhere else to go. Uh, we as citizens of BC or my, uh, the, the First Nations I work for, we have nowhere else to go. This is our pot of timber. And once it's gone, we have a problem. Toko, West Fraser, Weyerhaeuser, they, they've got the whole globe to work with. Matter of fact, warehouses already gone south. You know, they've gone and taken all the cream and gone south. Uh, West Fraser, Toco, uh, Interfor, they all have investments in the southeastern states. So they're, they're calculating that probably within 10 or 15 years, uh, there isn't going to be viable timber to, for their size and operation in this part of BC, and they're going to move somewhere else. We're the ones that are left with the, with the problem. Uh, as citizens of BC, you know, I can move to the coast or something. I can go do something else. Uh, Kateri is a First Nation. She has a, she has a traditional territory that she has a sacred obligation to look after. It's very doubtful she's got anywhere else to move. And that's where, that's where, you know, when we talk about First Nations involvement and how that can help us out, that's where that comes in. Is the First Nation has nowhere else to move. They have their territory to look after. They have a sacred obligation to their territory, to their land, to all the living beings on it, the water included, and they take that seriously. And so let's, let's go into talking about the value of partnership with First Nations. So when I use that word partnership with First, First Nations, um, Mike, tell me what that means to you. And Kateri, I'd be interested to hear what that means to you as well. Uh, what it means to me is that uh, the, the First Nation I work for, many First Nations in the interior of BC, have never ceded or surrendered their land. Uh, they put an offer on the table in 1910 to the, the Prime Minister of Canada. They offered to share in their land, 50, and their resources 50-50. It's called the Sir Wilfrid Laurier Memorial. Uh, and what I suggest is that we take them up on that offer, and uh, we manage the land on a 50-50 basis so that we're both equal at the table, both the First Nations government and the BC government is equal at the table and equal in decision making. All right, thanks for that, Kateri. So what does partnership with First Nations mean to you in terms of land management, management and forestry? 
Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, I obviously agree with, with everything that, that Mike has said uh, to this point. You know, I think, as he said, you know, for, for the Sequem Nation, and, you know, I am, a, I am a member of that nation, you know, as he said, you know, there, we, don't, we don't have anywhere else to go, not, nor would we wish to. This is our territory. We have an obligation, um, you know, rights and responsibilities to, to our, you know, for, for stewardship and caretakership. And insofar as partnerships, it that you know those those rights and and responsibilities to that stewardship and caretakership now sort of afford these um, really groundbreaking opportunities for partnerships because you've got uh, you know as Mike has said First Nations groups that uh, know the territory they they grew up here this has been you know speaking for myself this has been my home since time immemorial. Uh, so there's, there's just a, a multitude of benefits and opportunities that come from partnering with First Nations, not only operationally, having people that uh, know the territory, know the land, as Mike had said, know the different uh, understory species and know the different uh, plants and medicines and uses that go beyond just fiber extraction. Your benefit, you know, you, you and then you have benefits too to uh, for for the protection and stewardship of that land as well. Uh, one of the focal points for for many um, indigenous groups, um, obviously for the Sahuatl as well, is water. It's it's at the center and the heart of, of everything that we do. So talking about uh, watershed watershed management and protection, and undertaking forest management with water at the center um, and protection of those watersheds. You know, you have experts um, that experts in the territory, experts in 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 the ways that they've always practiced and and harvested and and undertaken stewardship since time immemorial. So, I think for for a multitude of reasons, it's just there's boundless opportunities for for partnerships that go beyond just sort of the standard, you know, boots on the ground operational uh, benefits to having some some uh, some more workers. I I just think that it's in order for you know the the forestry industry to move forward in a in a real uh, a meaning and real and meaningful way that protects uh, you know considers the environment and, and yeah of stewardship say. resources it'll have to you know it, it it's i think the future is is partnering with first nations and it like mike said tying back to that 1910 memorial to sir wilfrid laurier uh, you know, sharing in 50-50 and undertaking joint management stewardship on the land together for the benefit of, of uh, Tamil, or which in Sahuat Machine is, is the land and resources and everything on the earth. Thank you for that. And then Kateri, in terms of sort of the legal structure of what that might look like, since you're um, involved in law, uh, do you have some suggestions or ideas for, you know, the structure, the institutional agreement that would be required how, how might that look uh, in terms of the legislation that in BC? Because right now, BC legislation uh, essentially is this sort of centralized legislation around forestry, centralized decision making. It's a you know one size fits all. We're we're logging for volume. That's it. Wait, vol harvesting volumes is all that matters. And the other word for harvesting volumes is corporate profit. So essentially, we've got corporations making all the decisions about land that belongs to the people. And so um, are there any kind of specific changes that you would wanna see in legislation to enable um, you know, community management, both, both for indigenous communities and non-indigenous communities or, or communities that are blend? What, what do you foresee or what would you like to see in legislation? Uh, I Oh man, you know, we, we could be here, we could be here all night. That's such a, a really good technical question. And I'd love to hear Mike's thoughts. I know, you know, for on the technical side, uh, you know, as, as a forester and, and we have the benefit of working with a multitude of, of technicians and, and foresters at our Comita Sequatum table. Uh, and I'm sure they could, they could talk about that all day. Um, but in terms of some of the opportunities that I see currently, uh, you know, the government just passed the the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, or or DRIPA, or the Declaration Act, however people choose to to refer to it. And within within DRIPA, it empowers uh, the government to make agreements with with Indigenous governing bodies or Indigenous groups. 
Um, and I think that that is truly a step in the right direction. And, and uh, you know, my, my personal opinion on the matter as well, I, I think truly that um, it's, it's the role of government to, to empower First Nations um, to do that work themselves. So sort of pro provide the opportunities, pro provide the, the support, be it capacity or, or in whatever format um, that's appropriate. and uh, sort of get out of the way, I guess, at that point, right? So, you know, we've got, uh, as you said, the, the Forest Act is is what it is right now. And I don't anticipate, I'm, I'm sure it'd be, it seems like it's quite a colossus to try and shift anything there, at least in sort of the near term. Um, I think that an opportunity that currently exists for us and, and one that we're pursuing, um, obviously, is through the Declaration Act and that new legislation. It's, you know, it's, uh, I think referencing sort of being on the cusp of some of that groundbreaking cutting edge work, this is it, you know, DRIPA is, it's a, it's a new piece of legislation that, um, you know, there, there really isn't any precedent for currently. So I think there's a, a fairly big opportunity there, um, you know, and speaking to currently and operationally what, what we're doing right now, um, there, there's opportunity right now for, for partnership in sort of government to government agreements, which is sort of where, where I currently come in and, and, uh, and, and my role right now uh, with the Kwame to Sequatm, which is a, a government to government agreement with, with the province of BC. Uh, so I think that's, that is another example of, of how we can sort of undertake some, some meaningful change on, on the land base um, and, and work towards sort of shifting some of those uh, behemoth uh, pieces of legislation like the Forest Act uh, while uh, sort of on the ground potentially influencing policy or, or making regulatory changes and sort of trying to trying to inch our way up sort of I guess in a stepwise or, or you know piece by piece manner. So those are some of the sort of um, long term of course it'd be great to make some some uh, changes to, to legislation. I think DRIPA is a great opportunity currently that exists for, 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 for First Nations, um, as well sort of boots on the ground right now. I, th I think uh, these government to government agreements um, help build that relationship and uh, serve as an effective vehicle to sort of get us to some, some meaningful change. Excellent, thanks. Mike, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I'd like to add that Kateri says the Forest Act is very hard to change, but I noticed that about 15 or 20 years ago, they took the pertinency clause of the Forest Act, which had a dramatic effect upon the whole small town BC. Since they've taken that out, probably half the mills in the interior have closed down. Uh, towns have gone broke, et cetera, et cetera. So when the government says, oh gosh, we can't change the Forest Act, they're full of crap. Excuse my language, you know. Yeah, recently I had so a conversation. The precedent has been set. What's that? The precedent has been set. Yeah, and, and I don't know, you know, like we've talked to the government and we'll say these things and what they say, well, you know, or they'll say things like, well, we've got a, we've got a contract. This force license is a contract with the company, so we can't break that contract. We have to respect the rule of law and the letter of the law. In the meantime, are they, un are they respecting UNDRIP? Are they respecting DRIPA? Are they respecting those things? Are they respecting rights and title? You know, the, the underlying fact here is that the Sequatmic people have never given up title to their land. BC's declared title, uh, utilizing, uh, utilizing, gosh, what the heck is it? Uh, help me out here, Katiri. What's that? Uh, what gave the uh, gave the Not Spanish? In there? Yeah. Say that again. The doctrine of discovery? Yes, they've utilized the doctrine of discovery to give them rights or to give them so-called rights to this land. And the doctrine of discovery is a pretty, pretty haywire act. Uh, and it's pretty prejudicial. And really the scrapping you never given up right or title to this land. So they have just as much right to this land as BC. BC's gone and compromised those rights by issuing licenses to third parties. And then they're sitting there saying, well, gosh, we can't, we can't uh, you know, compromise that, that license that we've issued to third party, but we can ignore. We can ignore the rights of the Sequatmic people and the title of the Sequatmic people. 
And to me, that's, that's duplicious. If you're going to follow the letter of the law, the rule of law, do it all around. I've had now, this is one of the other problems we have with forest management in BC is we're talking about, we're talking about co-management between the two governments that have rights to land. Up till now, it's been co-management between the BC government and industry. And it still is. We entered an agreement here about five years ago to, uh, to provide guidelines for moose management and, and harvesting around moose, uh, moose habitat areas. And instead of it being a, a bilateral table between the two governments, industry was involved and industry swayed it. And that's not right. If we're going to have a discussion between the two governments that own title this land, it's got to be between First Nations and the government of the BC. And industry has to be a third party outside that discussion and has to put up with whatever the heck that discussion uh, amounts to. Uh, at the same time, industry is not doing us any favors. Industry just closed down Vavenby. The town of Vavenby has gone broke. Industry closed down Boston Bar Mill, closed down the Litton Mill, closed down the Lillet Mill, you know, closed down 70 Mile Mill. Now, is that helping the people of BC? Is that helping the rural people of BC? It's not helping them one darn bit. And real to that, that timber within the area of Clinton or whatever, to me, belongs to the Sequipmic people and the people of Clinton. It doesn't belong to West Fraser, or it should not. And yet we put ourselves in a situation where we compromise to the point where West Fraser shareholders in New York and, uh, and Seattle and Vancouver have more say over what happens in that forest than the people of the land that live in that forest and the First Nations who have managed that forest for 10,000 years. Yeah, recently I've had quite a few conversations with different people from all walks of life, people who've worked in uh, government ministries in the past, uh, foresters, um, uh, union representatives, union workers, uh, and so the 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 BC government likes to claim that they don't have the the power or the authority or the ability to make changes and yet we know that with the sweep of a pen they can do that and one of the the um the hammers that they could use for example is the um the, the environment and land statute sorry if i got that the name of that statute wrong um but with the sweep of a pen uh doug donaldson could 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 uh make changes to protect the environment and so what seems to be lacking is the political will to make those changes. And one of the things that we're trying to, to aim for with this summit is to unify people's efforts because there's people across BC who are trying to make these things happen. And we're all sort of working in our individual silos. Um, you guys are doing stuff on the ground. You're also doing the government to government stuff on a, you know, on a, a sort of a legislative legal angle. And, um, so unifying our efforts is important. And my question, and this is a big question for a lot of our guests has been, uh, how do you think we, we start to create that political will to make these changes that we want? I think, I think we team up with First Nations because they have the legal foot in the door to get control back from that force. Uh, so I think, I think we work with them. Because us as citizens don't seem to have that, don't seem to have that power because we've, uh, you know, our government has compromised the land base. Uh, First Nations seems it's a darn good excuse to at least get 50% of that land base back under, under local control. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think that's our best bet is to support them and support them in what they're doing. Because First Nations will look after that land an awful lot better than the companies will. You might get the odd, you might get the odd instance where they, they go after the buck. But in general, when you go back to the core values within a First Nation, when you go back to the, the grassroots people, it's all about protection of the Tamuk, as Kateri says. Tamuk mean the land and all the resources on it. You know, going right down to the, to the beetles and the bugs and the water, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, corporations don't have that interest. I took my forestry in the 90s, and what we talked about was fiber. We didn't talk about force management. We talked about fiber management. And that is what it was, that's what our institutions were teaching all through the 90s. I see they've changed a little bit and they're starting to look at the forest a little more, more holistically. But it's been a very single, uh, single focused, uh, single resource focused uh, method of management for the last 50 or 60 years. And we have to move away from that. Great. And so for political. I guess there's one other thing I'd like to say. There's one other thing I'd like to say between First Nations, between a First Nations perspective and a Western perspective. First Nations, in, in the First Nations perspective, we're all related. Everything is related. Uh, no one animal, no one being is, is superior to another. Uh, and that's why they say at the end of their prayers, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, Kateri, uh, lots of times there'll be a prayer and they say, all my relations. And all my relations means all the living things on the land, including plants and trees, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a respect for that. Uh, Western society, you know, the good Lord gave us dominion over all animals and plants at some point, it says in the Bible. And we figure that we can control it. You know, we can control those things. And yet we don't feel that they were part of them. We feel that we're superior to them. And yet I'm not sure, you know, I don't think we are. I think we have to look at that everything is important. Uh, the example I use is what's the most important or what's the, what has, what, what uh, organism has had the most eco economic effect in BC forestry in the last 50 years? Uh, I would say it's the pine beetle. How big is the pine beetle? It's the size of a match head. So that tiny organism, even though we, we would uh, normally, we wouldn't even bother about things like that, right? When we talk about wildlife in the forest, we worry about the moose or the bears. We don't see the little animals. Every one of them is just as big as important as the big animals. And within a First Nation perspective, I think you get that. We asked the elders one time, what's the most important animal out there? We did a study about 20 years ago. What's the most important animal in your eyes? And what they said was, they're all important. Uh, as Western society, we don't. You know, what's the most important resource on the land base for the last 60 years has been fiber. I think what we're going to figure out here uh, is the most important resource on the land base is water. And uh, close second is biodiversity, but we're, we're just in the process of figuring that out right now. First Nations have known this for the last 10,000 years. Yeah, I would, uh, I would have to agree with Mike, a term that I've often heard uh, utilized in speaking to, like Mike said, the, the, um, you know, the piece that, that he mentioned at the end of our, often at the end of our prayers, you know, the, the all my relations, uh, um, or have heard in the past is concentric ecology. And I think that that, uh, you know, surmises a lot of what the points that Mike has said in and around stewardship and, and biodiversity, right? So, you know, looking at looking at everything in the world around you as, you know, as members of your kin. And uh, I think that that's such a, an important part. And, and speaking of on your point, uh, Jennifer, around political will, I, I think, as you're right, I think there is an opportunity to, to really unify voices here. You know, I don't think we're a lot of the different, you know, entities, um, you know, be, be them citizen driven or NGOs. Oftentimes, you know, we're not working or, and, you know, I also included in that, you know, First Nations and, and that. Uh, I don't think we're working at, at cross purposes. Um, I, I would agree with Mike that I kind of, I think that, you know, there there's a, a time and I think the current uh, environment to sort of write for, for some, you know, self-education and, and, um, and sort of maybe working to, to get outside of that silo, outside of those silos means these sort of external groups or, um, interest groups or, or citizen groups or what have you, um, you know, working, like Mike said, working with First Nations, but also um, endeavoring to, to educate themselves on, on the land and areas in which they currently reside and work. You know, I think that that's such a small step, but it's so important and so vital, like Mike said, to really understand and take up those, the same values of, of, the, of the First Nations groups in, in, which, in which reside on those lands. So I have a question then. Um, one of the, the ideas that uh, 
someone came up with for that that we could um, initiate as a project out of this summit was the idea of forming an interior coalition of um, community groups and um, you know small local environmental groups and nature-based groups and we all start to work together to push for changes to forestry legislation and so let's say a group like that forms what is the best approach do we do we form a group separate from first nations and then go to first nations and say we'd like to talk to you uh, sit down at the table and figure out how we partner together or is the better approach to, to invite uh, first nations to be part of that group like should we be traveling on parallel tracks as separate entities or we should, should we be blending as entities i i kind of uh, just in in my own from my own perspective i think what you'll find is it it'll you know it'll ultimately vary from um and i know it's not an easy answer but i i you know in my personal experience i i know that it'll it'll vary right from community to community from nation to nation um and so i think it's just being mindful and respectful of of that and and uh you know things like limited capacity quite often um communities uh you know don't have the capacity to to be supportive of of external groups or or committees and like i say it'll vary um, but just being respectful of, of maybe some of those constraints and, and providing sort of whatever support that that um, that you can obviously in a, in a respectful manner. The other, uh, on the flip side of that, what I would also say is early engagement is always better. Uh, I think that that's ultimately the most respectful way to go about something is you know at the at the front end of of um, you know. It's uh, it's ultimately always you know always best to to engage to engage early on, um, have everyone at the table rather than sort of showing up with with a or you know ready made group without the input or um, perspectives of especially especially for uh, you know first nations that reside within uh, the territories in which you're looking to sort of embark on uh, s such a thing as as a potential coalition. Excellent. Thank you for that perspective. I really appreciate that. It's it's been a bit challenging for me because in the boundary watershed, there there are aren't really any um, First Nations that have you know a strong permanent presence here. Um, unfortunately, the, the Canadian government pushed them out a long time ago, and uh, it's been difficult for them to get reestablished here. Um, so it's different for me working in my little area than it is for someone on Vancouver Island where there's a stronger First Nations presence. And, and so I really appreciate that you said that there's, the, there's a variety of capacity and uh, capacity is important. And I, and I also like the way that you talked about how the government, it's up to the government to create the structure to enable First Nations to, to build capacity. That's just, that's not just automatically there for everyone. And, and I would also, um, I like that suggestion too for for community groups like we're up against Interfor TFL8 they've presented us with this 100 page um, proposal for TFL8 and we're this little group the Boundary Forest Watershed Stewardship Society and we're supposed to comment on it we don't have the money to pay registered professional foresters to to evaluate and present a, you know, an, an argument against for or against any of the forestry practices they're proposing. So uh, I love that suggestion. It's up to the government to create the capacity and the structure to enable communities, people in communities to be able to manage the forests and, and get in on the conversation. So um, uh, uh, this has been a really great, great conversation and, and I love everything that you've said. Um, we, we can wrap it up soon. Um, I'm wondering if you'd like to uh, present some some final comments, some final ideas uh, about maybe the direction that we're going and um, some solutions. You, you've already talked about solutions. Um, maybe you could reiterate iterate, or um, what other ideas do you have uh, for the way forward? Um, Mike, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I have a caution against you working with First Nations. You can work with First Nations, but you have to recognize that First Nations is a government. They are a landowner. We are not. Uh, and this came out in the Camelot LRMP, like First Nations did not partake in the 
Camus LRMP that they did 25 years ago, partially because they got all the interest groups together, which were all part of the settler economy kind of thing. And then they wanted First Nations to join in as, a, in as an equal voice at the table, when realistically, First Nations voice should be equal to that of the government of BC. And as long as we can recognize that, that uh, in the interior BC, land has never been ceded or surrendered. The last offer that was put on the table was 50-50. You know, it's different, in, it's different in the rest of Canada. The rest of Canada, there's treaties been signed. Uh, even on the coast, there's a number of treaties been signed. In the interior BC, there's never been any, any discussion, you know. That offer was put on the table by the chiefs in 1910 and basically ignored. Uh, after that, the BC government decided to make it illegal for, the, uh, for First Nations to pursue land claims of any kind for about 30 or 40 years. Uh, we've put that offer back on the table. I've been working for, oh, I don't know, 12, 12 years or more, uh, you know, leading up to the Kelmiti to government to government relationship and put that offer on the table. And we're still trying to get that 50-50 relationship working because it needs to not only be 50-50 say in the management of the land, but it needs to be a 50-50 50 50 split in the resources that come off that land and the government can't do that they, they have a very hard time with that you know they've committed everything to the industry essentially so it's about an 80 20 split between industry and the government uh so they don't want to do that 50 50 split with first nation but we have to be cognizant of that fact otherwise you're not going to get the first nation participation that you need uh, some ways, I think we might be better off forming a group outside of First have some First Nations involvement, but form a lobby group outside of First Nations, with dedicated to assisting them in their in their uh, claims and uh, getting you know uh, achieving their aspirations, which is basically to co-manage their land again. You know, to have some say over how the land is managed. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is, I think I maybe bring a little different perspective to this than an awful lot of professional foresters. I, uh, I put in my bio that I've been living on the land for, in the same place for 70 plus years. And there's not, I don't know very many non-First Nation people that have been living. Uh, what I'm saying is I don't see very many, I don't see very many non-First Nations that have lived in the same blinking place for their whole life. It's just a part of our nature as non-First Nations that, you know, we'll live in Camels for 10 or 20 years and we move to Vancouver or we move to Victoria or we move back to Ontario, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what your experience has been, but I don't know very many non-First Nations people that have lived in the same place all their life. Because what you get to see is you get to see how things have actually changed. You know, as a professional forester, you get to see the decisions you made 50 years ago, what come to fruition or not. You know, you get to see the mistakes you made 30 years ago and what they result in. Uh, very few professional foresters or professional people get to see that. Uh, on the other hand, First Nations do. First, Kateri's got the experience of herself, her grandmother, her grandmother's grandmother. She's got that experience in her uh, you know, in her, in her lifestyle kind of thing. And all First Nations have that. They have that perspective. She probably has a better idea what this land looked like 200 years ago than any, any non-First Nations living on it. And that's an important perspective because when we just flit in and out of an area and we stay there 10 or 20 years, everything looks fine. But then 10 years later, it all goes to hell in a handbasket. And we don't get to see that because we've moved to Victoria. And I see a lot of that, a lot of that within the professional forestry industry. Very few people, you know, the Ministry of Forests and Camelops, very few of those people have been there more than 10 years. Uh, they've been around BC. They have the advantage of having uh, experience in other jurisdictions. Nevertheless, they haven't seen the Camelops forests for their whole life. Thank you for that, Mike. I think that's a really important point. When, when uh, your people, your family, has been on the land for so long, the land becomes tied to your ancestry. It, and if you're flitting around from place to place, it's, yeah. you don't get emotionally invested in it. You don't get, it doesn't get in your DNA. 
and uh, you don't care as much. So thank you for that. Uh, Kateri, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, I just building off of what Mike had said as well, you know, I, quite often, uh, you know, First Nations are used to sort of tick a box as it were, or sort of bring in and, and, uh, you know, we see that quite often with, with the consultation process and, and, you know, and with industry and with government sort of saying, well, we've talked to First Nations, therefore, we're okay to move forward on this, or we've got, you know, we did our best uh, kind of thing. So that's, you know, building off of Mike's caution there too, uh, you know, what, what First Nations require is, you know, true and meaningful uh, engagement to be able to really uh, weigh, you know, weigh in, in in a real way, real manner and provide, provide their, their perspectives. And, and, you know, Mike had said, I think it all comes back to, to co-management and, and, you know, one of the key tenets out of uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is that right to, to self-determination. And so empowering First Nations to, and Indigenous groups uh, to be able to, 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 govern, to govern themselves um, and put that, you know, empower them and, and put that power back sort of in, the, in their hands to, to effectively manage, manage the territory um, for, the better, for the betterment of, of everybody. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Any anything you wanted to add to that, and then we'll we'll close, Mike. Yep. I have something to add. We we have a, a joint uh, table with the with the government uh, on the Elephant Hill fire. The Elephant Hill fire burned one hundred ninety two thousand hectares uh, within our ter territory here about three years ago. Uh, we set up a table, a joint government to government table, to heal that fire. Uh, we sit with the government technicians, our technicians sit with their technicians, and very often the issues we bring up as First Nations and the, the uh, way forward we bring up as First Nations, you've got the government guys, technicians, shaking their head and saying, yes, yes, we would like to say this, but we are constrained. We can't say these things because within our system, we, we're going we're gonna to insult industry or not insult industry but we're gonna get industry mad at us and that doesn't work within the government system so really there's quite a few allies within government at the lower levels i believe that they probably think the same way you and i do uh there's a, a level in victoria an upper level in victoria somewhere between the uh, assistant deputy minister and the minister that is very resistant to that you know and, and this government uh, with all due respect, I uh, went and, uh, you know, put, uh, who the heck was it, John, what's his name in there, who used to be the president of Kofi as the deputy minister. What the heck do they expect? They're going to reform forestry in BC with him in the lead. Uh, what kind of for reform do you think you're going to get out of that? Anyway, you probably can't put this in an interview, but. You didn't uh, say anything that's not true. Um, and that the opinion. Okay. The opinion that there are people in the higher echelons of the ministries who are resistant to changing forestry, that's not the first time I've heard that opinion. And I've heard that from someone who used to be in government in those high echelons. And I've heard it directly oh, from someone who's in there now. And um, so thank you for that. It's, it's a, a reaffirmation of things that I've heard from, from other places. All right, and, and definitely a reaffirmation of many of the things that other people from um, other walks of life have said. And I, I really appreciate that you guys talked about the legal aspects of this, um, government to government, First Nations rights, and the DRIPA. Thank you so much for bringing this to us. Um, uh, it's been a really great conversation. I hope that we can have more conversations in the future. Um, we, we've got some strategy sessions coming up at the end of this summit. Uh, for people to form individual action plans and talk about forming groups. And uh, hopefully uh, we can find a way to do our best to work with First Nations and, um, and make it count. That's important. So thank you so much and, and have a great night. Thanks so much, Jennifer.